Good evening. Good to be with you all. Happy Monday. It's Monday, January 25th, and uh, we are um, not live tonight. It's the afternoon as I'm recording this. What's going on this week? A uh, um, choir concert tonight at Toledo Christian for my oldest, and uh, so I'm um, still mastering the two places at once, but this is a good step in that direction. Um, so we're going to be uh, looking at the miracles of Jesus again tonight, and tonight um, we're calling an audible. I told you last week that we were going to be looking at Jesus' healing of the lame man, um, but we're actually going to um, step outside of that and take a later session that I had planned to get to in a couple weeks, but this is uh, timely for us. Uh, we're going to be looking at the raising of Lazarus, one of Jesus' most incredible miracles. Not the most incredible miracle, we'll save the best for last uh, in our 12-week series here, but Jesus raising Lazarus from the grave, um, very pertinent for us these days. Um, if you haven't heard, uh, Trinity Lutheran School here lost one of our um, one of our best. Uh, God uh, called uh, Mr. Thacker home. Our fourth grade teacher uh, went to bed at home on Thursday night and woke up in heaven on Friday morning. He, um, we, We're not quite sure the cause. It was completely unexpected. And um, so prayers for the family are appreciated for our school family here. And uh, we pray that uh, Studying the resurrection of Lazarus today would give us some joy in the midst of this sorrow that we're in, um, in this unexpected uh, time. So let's uh, let's start by uh, looking at um, Psalm 23, which is a very familiar psalm for us. Not just um, not just at funerals, but it definitely is is at a number of funerals. It's the uh, one of the go-to psalms for funeral service, but. Uh, but it's something that most people are familiar with. Uh, if they only know three verses from the Bible, this might be one of them. Uh, John 3.16 and Genesis 1.1 and Psalm 23. I don't know. That just came off the top of my head. But uh, this is definitely in the, the recognizable section of Scripture uh, for even the secular world. But uh, this is Psalm 23. Uh, we'll hear these words um, and, and place them in the context of, as, as I was just speaking about, the loss of a loved one. Um, per perhaps you're you're um, dealing with that because you knew Mr. Thacker yourself. Jess uh, was well loved by many, and so he's he's touched a lot of lives in our community and beyond. Um, as he served as a teacher in Kansas and also in Texas, and uh, but uh, we're uh, face to face with death throughout our lives, and and so this Psalm 23 is a great place to go when we're um, considering death. And and so let's hear uh, hear what David says. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. With that, let's pray. Father in heaven, you are the, you are the, the, 
the author. <laughs> You're the one in control of all things. And Lord, when we confront death, we often feel um, that more than ever we have no control. And Lord, may we be reminded once again of your power this day. Um, and even more so, may we be reminded of our good shepherd who has defeated death. Uh, we ask your blessing in his name and we ask your Holy Spirit to saturate us during this time of studying your word, Lord, that this living water that flows from you to us today would uh, give us um, comfort in this day and, and in all our days. Uh, bless our study in, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So let's get into it. And um, we are in um, John chapter 11. We're going to have a, a rather lengthy uh, reading. I think it might be the longest uh, miracle account, um, at least in this uh, series that we're doing on uh, so, so John chapter 11, if you have your Bible and you want to turn there and we'll, uh, we'll get right into that after we have a couple preliminary questions. As I mentioned at the beginning, I am not live right now. This is pre-recorded on the afternoon of January 25th. It was not my intention when I started this study to pre-record all of them, but right now 66% of these uh, three so far have been pre-recorded. Uh, so hopefully we'll be live next week just for the, if not anything else, the novelty of it because we don't always get questions on the fly, but when we do, it's it makes for a a little bit of interaction. So if you do have questions though about something I say, I do want to uh, be heard by you. Um, I do want to hear you is what I should say. Uh, so please text your questions to me if I say something that confuses you or if you want more information about something, please uh, shoot me a message and I'll do my best to get to those um, as quickly as I can. So let's uh, let's look at this uh, um, this miracle. How, does, how do Jesus healings differ from medical treatment. His miracles, um, and, and definitely uh, th this question might be a little bit out of place because I think it follows on the heels of studying some of Jesus' uh, healing miracles, but think about the blind and the lame and the deaf that he gives us uh, sight and the ability to walk and hearing to. How is that different than, than medical treatment in the day? Uh, well, in our day, well, medical treatment um, often takes time. Um, might be one of the big obvious differences, uh, whereas Jesus' healing is just like, hey, here's a little bit of mud in my spit, and here it is on your eyes, and um, we are good to go. Let me stick my fingers in your ears, and you're good to go. <laughs> or let me just tell you to rise up and walk, and you do. So there's uh, an immediacy. Um, he, uh, he used directly his divine power, and there wasn't uh, um, intermediary um, uh, physical therapies or treatments or even eyeglasses or, or surgeries. Uh, Jesus didn't do any of those things. He used his power, his word, um, to to heal. And so that that is probably one of the biggest obvious differences. Um, how do Jesus' healings exceed things done by medical personnel? Um, well, as it's done by his divine power, he's not uh, constrained to the physical limitations that uh, medical workers have uh, at their um in front of them, the obstacles that get in the way, uh, whether it be time constraints or whether it be just the limits of medical knowledge and, and medical abilities. Uh, the, um, the, um, there are limits that, that medical professionals do run into, and one of the biggest limits is that of death. Death cannot be overcome by medical professionals, and so uh, Jesus' healings uh, go beyond the grave is what we're going to get into today. Um, and so nothing is beyond Jesus' power, not even death. May we be comforted by that. May we rejoice in that. And may we uh, learn a little bit more about that tonight. So with those uh, kind of thought-provoking um, questions uh, paving the way, let's get into the text here. John chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. John's in the New Testament. As I turn there just for my uh, references' sake. Um, words will be on the screen for you here. Uh, John 11, verse 1 through 6. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Now, um, Jesus heard it. He said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Now he loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Let me read that again. He loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. We'll come back to that verse because it doesn't seem to make sense. Um, 
So uh, some of Jesus' miracles were done for strangers. What was Jesus' relationship with Lazarus and his sisters? Um, Jesus was acquainted with this family. These are familiar characters to the story. I think this is the first time we meet Lazarus, uh, definitely by name. Uh, but but we had uh, Mary anointing Jesus' feet uh, in John chapter 12, verse 3. Um, it's interesting that... Uh, uh, John's chronology is revealed here that he is not chronological in his order because uh, the story of uh, Mary anointing uh, Jesus' feet with her hair comes after the story in, in John's gospel. But um, So just a, a little tidbit there. Um, so Jesus uh, visited uh, their home before. In, in, in Luke chapter 10, Mary uh, was um, learning while Martha was laboring. And so, so that, uh, that home was a place where Jesus had been before. He had been with them. Um, and, and the bottom line is, we get it in verse 5, is that Jesus loved this family. Now, um, there's a little bit of a uh, question here. I, I, want, we'll, I think we'll come back to it next and the next set of questions. So when he heard that Lazarus is ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. I just hold on to that because that's something that I think we can find a lot of, uh, I don't know if it's comforting, but a lot of uh, truth in that uh, the Lord doesn't necessarily do what we expect because the, I mean just this sentence right here. Let me just let me just dwell on it before we move on here. Sorry for, for uh, let me turn my mouse into a laser beam here. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so he went immediately and healed, healed him. That's what you would expect. So he he asked the Lord in heaven. He asked his Father to heal Lazarus immediately. You would expect that of Jesus, right? That's what God is supposed to do when, when he loves someone and he knows that they have a need. He's supposed to fix it immediately for them. Um, but no, he says, um, I'll stay here two days longer. All right, sorry. Belaboring that maybe, hopefully laying some uh, ground for a resolution in a bit. The text goes on. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. After this, after the two days, let us go to Judea again. Then the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews who were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going to go there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light in the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. I think I butchered that at some point here. Um, so, after saying these things, Jesus said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. So Jesus waits two days, he does some teaching, and he says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he'll recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So we get a little bit of hint as to why Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, and so he did not go right away. Um, here he was glad because he was not there so that you may believe. This is, um, this is most certainly true. This is not most certainly um, easy for us to wrestle with all the time, but this is, this is your Jesus, and um, let's, let's learn from him. All right. Um, so Thomas called the twin said to his fellow disciples let us also go that we may die with him because he had said let's go to uh, Judea where uh, the Jews had been mean to him and they might be mean to him again um, and uh, Thomas called the twin this is Thomas doubting Thomas um, Thomas Didymus uh, which is the word for twin there uh, so you might hear him called that sometime but we're, we often know him as doubting Thomas but here this is one of my this is my favorite Thomas statement he says let's go die with him <laughs> There's not a lot of doubt there. There's a undoubtedly a dedication to our Lord in that, and that's uh, something that we should uh, revel in for, for Thomas, who often gets the bad rap or the sympathetic rap of, you know, we, we have doubts too. Um, but anyways, sorry. Verse 17, Jesus came. He found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Oh, all right. What surprising thing did Jesus do when he heard Lazarus was sick? Here's the question, the loaded question. When did he take action? How do Jesus' words indicate that he knew what he was going to do? So Jesus loved Lazarus, but he waited two days after hearing Lazarus was dead. He, de after he was sick, he took action after hearing Lazarus was dead. Um, Jesus' words to his disciples show that he knew what was happening. Um, no one except 
Jesus knew at that moment, the messengers were not there anymore saying, okay, now he's dead. That would be a new set of messengers which were not alerted to. Jesus knew because he knows all things that Lazarus was dead. Um, so he, he tells his disciples that he's going to wake Lazarus from the sleep of death. Jesus, perfectly in control of the situation, knows what's going to happen. Store that away because that comes back in in just a little bit here. Um, while Jesus could have just healed Lazarus from wherever he was or, or gone and healed his sickness, he chooses to do an even greater miracle, raise him from the dead, that through it people might believe. So why, when did he take action upon knowing of his death? How do his words indicate that he knew what he was going to do? Because he said it to his disciples, hey, he's fallen asleep and he will awaken again. And the disciples are like, well, if he's asleep, of course he's going to wake up. He says, no, no, he's died, and I am going to raise him. So that, very clearly, Jesus knew what he was going to do. On in the text, 11 verse 18, Bethany was near Jerusalem about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Kind of switching roles, aren't they, there? Because Martha was a worker before. Anyways, um, Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Hmm. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. What did Martha say to Jesus when he arrived in Bethany? I know that you can do anything and God will do whatever you ask. Um, um, she, she, um, she's on some levels blaming him. Lord, if you had been here, you could have done something. Um, so that's the first thing she says to him is um, basically, why didn't you come sooner? You could have healed him like you've healed other people. Um, but Jesus uh, says to her, your brother will rise again. So, so she says, if you would have been here, you could have healed my brother, but I know whatever you ask of God. So her words reveal faith to us. Um, she knew what his power could do. She trusted that a miracle could still take place. Um, and, and it wasn't um, necessarily clear, though, here, but a little bit later on, we're going to see that she kind of uh, uh, doesn't understand completely what his power is. Um, so she, she's asking maybe for some comfort at this time, um, but not necessarily asking for a miracle. But Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And she's, she's thinking, okay, yeah, in the last day, um, he'll rise again. But he's, he's saying, no, 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 this is a better thing. So how did Jesus respond when Martha talked about the resurrection? That's kind of what I'm saying there. Uh, what do his words tell us? He, his words tell us that he knows the immediacy of her need. He, he is the resurrection and the life. This is a resurrection. This is one thing that I, I, I wish we could more fully grasp, and it almost makes it sound mystical when we talk about it, but there's a beauty in knowing that in your baptism you are buried with Christ into his death so that just as he has risen from the dead, you too might walk in newness of life. The resurrection reality of Jesus is an already thing for you, um, which is great joy and comfort for us. We often think of uh, the resurrection as the life of the world to come, the resurrection of the dead, the life of the world to come. That's how we say it in the Apostles' Creed. But we are walking in the newness of life even right now. Um, that's the hope that we live in. That's the joy that we live in. That's the contentment, the peace. Again, the fruits of the Spirit that we live in, those things are resurrection, things that we get now, um, now only kind of as samples at times, uh, then um, when we're with him in glory or when he comes to judge the living and the dead and we are um, in the life of the world to come, that will be the full course meal, the feast of heaven set before us uh, to dabble back into the, uh, the water, into wine miracle last week. Um, but, but his words tell us that he is, he is in control. He is, he is uh, the one who will raise Lazarus and will raise uh, Jess Thacker, will raise you, will raise me, will raise those who, who believe in him. Do you believe this? <laughs> 
This is great. Um, we'll raise Martha. She believes this. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. So, so how does Jesus respond? He, he kind of clears... Uh, He's not fully clear here because there's even some hesitancy when he when we go on to the text. She, she's she's um, saying, if you would have been here, you could have healed him. He's saying, um, he will rise. And she's saying, I, I know he'll rise in the resurrection of the dead. And he says, I am the resurrection. Do you believe this? And so he's still not cleared this up for what he intends to do for them, what he, why he's dragging his feet uh, what a great storyteller. I don't know. He's, he's written the story of the world. He's written the story of your life. Uh, sometimes they're beautiful. Sometimes they seem darker than others. But, but the Lord is in control. And I think that's um, one thing we can take away from this miracle. It's the thing we can take away from this miracle. All right. So on in the text, 28, when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, Teacher's here and calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews were, who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind men also have kept this man from dying? Good question. All right, so lots of people mourning for Lazarus. We get that picture quite clearly here. How does Jesus respond to his friend's death when he arrives at the grave? He, he weeps. Uh, shortest verse in the Bible there, uh, John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. Um, so Jesus weeps. Um, um, this, is, this is powerful um, because people might think it's strange that uh, he, he weeps here. And I, I want to throw a couple reasons why he's weeping out here. Number one, he's human. He's fully human. He knows the, the range of human emotions that assault us. So, so I, I love how he's moved with compassion uh, in, in his spirit greatly troubled, deeply moved in spirit greatly troubled when he sees her weeping. Isn't that the way it goes? That sometimes we're able to hold it together, but when we see somebody else, oh, the floodgates just burst open and you can't contain yourself. <laughs> it happens. Uh, front row seat to that many times this past week, um, participant in that many times this past weekend. So, um, so yes, we, we know that. And, and I think that's not, I'm not, please don't take my suggestions here moving forward to, 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 to um, diminish that reality, because I think that's the first level what's going on here. But I think there's a couple other ways we can uh, understand Jesus weeping. Why would Jesus weep? Well, Perhaps he was weeping because these people didn't know his power or the comfort of his presence um, as good as it was. They didn't know who he was. Uh, maybe a, a soft chance of that. But, but I, my favorite way, and I can't remember the first time I heard this, probably somewhere at seminary with a smart person around me, um, but the idea that um, Jesus is weeping because he knows what he's about to do to Lazarus. He's about to take Lazarus away from the best place ever. That's, that's what paradise is. So um, Jesus says to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. That's what happens when we die um, in faith. We, we go to paradise to be with Jesus. That's, <laughs> well, um, Jesus wasn't in paradise when Lazarus died because he was on earth. Anyways, we go to be with God in paradise. And so, so Jesus knows, perhaps Jesus is weeping because he knows Lazarus is going to have to die again is the bottom line here. And, and the, the, this earth for all its glories and for all the familial and friend connections we have and all the pain that we feel when we lose a loved one, our loved one, we know when they die in the faith, they don't feel any sorrow or loss. They're not missing out. They're not saying, oh, I forgot to wash the car, or I forgot to tell somebody, or I wanted to be at that birthday party, or, you know, for them, they are in the best place ever. So Jesus weeping here is, I think, maybe on some levels, at least we can say homiletically, which is what I like to say when at least it makes a good sermon, you know. It's a good Bible study handle, maybe not exactly as powerful as, like I said, that first 
reading, that first level, obvious Jesus is weeping because the people around him are traumatized. This is his friend who's, this is a very sorrowful thing. Uh, death is not something that we're like, ah, that feels okay. Uh, death is not meant to feel okay because God did not intend death. That's why he sent Jesus to undo death. Um, so, so the weeping in the face of death, I think, is something that we can, in first level, like I said, uh, realize Jesus is weeping because death is Ugh, it's icky. It's it's not the way things are supposed to be. But then uh, also um, the fact that Lazarus is going to be brought back um, into the world of sin. Uh, and who knows how long Lazarus lived. He was raised to die again. Jesus was risen, by the way, to never die again, which is the resurrection that we all look forward to, um, that, that Martha was speaking about with Jesus earlier. I know he will be raised on the last day. Uh, very powerful words there that demonstrate the resurrection theology that was already in play for the Jewish um, in, um, in that inter-period time as Jesus was teaching. That's, that's a powerful thing that, that we hold to know that the resurrection that Jesus wins for us was something that God's people were already anticipating and, and aware of. Um, and, and so we look forward to that. I'm all over the place. Forgive me, I, I felt like that was going to happen with this. So. So how did Jesus respond? He wept. Um, then Jesus deeply moved again. This is kind of repetitive. So G Jesus is deeply moved uh, um, a number of times here. He, it says clearly in verse 35, like I said, that he wept. But Jesus deeply moved again comes to the tomb. It's a cave and a stone lay against it. Uh, Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. I think the uh, uh, King James Version, Version says, Lord, he stinketh, uh, which is beautiful, poetic, and <laughs> funny. Um, Lord, by this time there would be an odor, for he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. What a way to start a prayer, by the way. Um, lead into your prayer with that one. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. <laughs> Throughout your life, uh, what, what is Jesus talking about? When did, when did the Lord start hearing him? All your days. Uh, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And even now, um, I know you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. So I wonder if Jesus has been praying in his mind, which is a good thing to do. Uh, be always, be pray continually, pray without ceasing. Uh, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Which, by the way, um, rejoice always is another very short verse of the Bible. I think that's another two-worder. Um, so, so Jesus says, I know that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, as if I prayed out loud for the sake of those around me, um, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! <laughs> Sorry, don't mean to yell. The man who had died came out. His hands and feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, let him go. Oh, wait, unbind him and let him go. <laughs> this is the mummy scene. What strange request did Jesus make at the tomb? Open the tomb. Uh, this makes perfect sense to us because we know what Jesus could and would do, but put yourself in their shoes. He, he delays for two days. Jesus, uh, Lazarus is dead now for four days and which, uh, doing that math. Anyway, so, so he's there. Um, I don't know the math on that. I, I don't know the days. Uh, but they're not expecting this guy who's, I don't think he's done that. I don't think his, his uh, resurrection miracles precede this one. So uh, this, is, this is new information. Yeah, he can make the blind see. He can, yeah, can't, can't this one make the blind, who made the blind see help this man? Couldn't he have helped when he was sick? <laughs> look at him showing up late to the game. And they're like, oh, he wants to look at the tomb? Well, nobody can overcome death. That's probably what they're, they're thinking. Why does Martha object? Because she doesn't think that this is going to be worth doing. She, she uh, thought maybe he just wanted to see the body, but this is awkward. This isn't the custom. And, um, but this is not in their kin, K-E-N, of, of realm of awareness that Jesus has the ability to do this. So, <laughs> pay attention. Jesus would not be deterred, though. He convinced them to remove the stone. What did he do next? He uh, prayed, 
and he called out. So he prayed aloud to his father, and then he commanded Lazarus to come out. I, I love the anecdotal thought sermon uh, idea that he, he had to say, Lazarus, come out. Because if he didn't say Lazarus, every single body, every dead would come out of their grave. So someday he will say, arise, and we will arise from our tomb. Um, every time I'm at Toledo Memorial Park or whatever, whatever funeral uh, cemetery I'm at, um, it's, it's fun to look around and think, this place is going to be hopping on the last day because they, um, we, we certainly have a lot of loved ones that we've laid to rest. But Jesus will say, rise, and they will rise on the last day. Um, he spoke and Lazarus came out. Um, it's, it's amazing that the man was bound still and comes out bound. And, and yeah, this brings comical images to mind of Halloween costumes and, and people wrapped with toilet paper type, you know, the, the, uh, the grave cloths. Uh, but, but nothing could hold him back. And, and that's a, this is just a beautiful picture for us to, to meditate on this week and, and really every day because the people's reaction um, is, is worth noting. So uh, where, where are we at here? Um, uh, unbind him and let him go. Um, I don't think we uh, do we have their their reaction. No, we, I don't think we've gotten to their reaction. So we'll come back to that question. Oh, sorry. This is uh, I, I I think I missed the end. Um, so Jesus said, "Take away the stone here." Boy, oh boy. So how did the people react when they saw him? Jesus, well, let's read the text. Uh, John 11, verse 43. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Verse 44, the man who had died came out with his hands and feet bound with linen strips, his faith, face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and seen what he did, believed in them, believed in him. So that's what the people react. Um, that's the most important reaction. We, we don't get the astonishment. We don't get the shock and awe that we would expect. We don't get the, the weeping and the... Uh, just imagine what you would do if your friend is in the tomb and, and you say, no, he's, he's gone. It's too late. No, he's, he stinks. Why? You can't dig him up. It, this isn't a right. And then all of a sudden, he, they're alive and they're there. The emotion that's emphasized in the story I love is Jesus' emotion. And yet we get we get Martha and Mary, who's too too verklempt to leave her home. Uh, there's my German for the day. But the um, we had uh, we had Jesus' emotion front and center, and we don't get the shock and awe here. And and I think this is one of the things that we've talked about with this miracle study here is that people's reaction miracles um, uh, miracles that that bring a, a shock and awe and wonder of the miracle. Is not a it's not a faith giving miracle. Miracles, because of the power of God, comfort us and and give us joy in the faith that we're given. So so many who had come with Mary, seen what He did, believed in Him, um, and and I think that's the important thing to realize in a miracle. Um, they didn't believe in the miracles. They they believed in Him, and and then um, it also goes on to say verse forty six, but. Some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So, so that's the other, the two-edged sword of these miracles is, yeah, it strengthens the faith for some um, in Jesus, but it also, uh, miracles aren't a, a shoe-in to say um, this is creating saving faith. People can still object to the Savior, um, and that's one of the things that we realize is that faith is a gift to God from us. We cannot create our own faith. We do not Faith does not originate in our reason. It doesn't come from our, oh, I read enough, and now I, I you know, it makes sense, and, and I believe. Um, no, we actually have the gift of faith given to us. That's why babies can believe. Uh, that's why we baptize babies, because faith is a gift from the Holy Spirit, and it's not up to our, our ability. We get to assent to that faith that's given to us, that we get to agree with that faith, and that's when we confirm our faith, and, and when we confess the creeds, and when we pray to the Lord, and and all of these things we do are, are, you know, acknowledging what God has given us. But at the same time, you can, Lord have mercy and, and may it not be so, you can say, I don't need that gift. And so that's that's what's at play here, the, the people's reaction both ways. They say, yeah, I believe in him. Um, and some are like, oh, this guy, is, he's, he's messing with the, he's, 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 
a thorn in the flesh of the Pharisees. Sorry, that's Paul. Paul is a Pharisee. Maybe they went and told Paul. Anywho, um, sorry. I don't know what these slides say. Jesus knowing what he uh, still, this is, um, yeah, so this is, this is the end. Sorry, sorry I left the, uh, the passage off at the end there, um, but hopefully you had your Bible and you were following along with the end of this. Uh, John 11 um, holds this miracle and, and lots of details in this. So, um, so to, to back up just a little bit, but to connect it to our lives, Jesus, knowing what he was going to do, still cried when he visits, visited Lazarus' grave. What might this tell us? When you are struck by emotion at the, the death of a loved one, tears are okay. That's, there you go. There's the, the easy answer. Even Jesus grieved for his friend. So that's, that's a good thing for us. And um, it's been interesting. Today is the first day back for our school students. Um, Friday, we, we walked around and Pastor Love and Principal Lance Craner uh, shared with the kids. Principal Lance Craner shared the facts. And uh, I love the, um, the way we... They planned it. Uh, Principal Lance Craner told them the fact Mr. Thacker died um, and a um, couple more details about it. You know, nothing major, just that he was died at home and um, wasn't expected. And, um, you know, we're, that's, that's there. And then Principal Pastor Love then started speaking God's truth because uh, the way they described it to me, and it's just a beautiful thing, is when uh, Mr. Thacker was suddenly dead in their minds, all of a sudden there's this vacuum and uh, Pastor Love stepped in and filled it with God's word. Um, but the tears were, uh, you know how everybody grieves differently. Some were immediately and some were um, uh, later on and some were strong and some were weak and some... Uh, are, are there, but but this is, uh, we, we all grieve differently, and one of the things that the fourth grade class did today, which was his class, uh, uh, one of our uh, parents in the school is, is filling in as a sub there, and she's perfect for the role. Um, she, she came up with this um, project for them to do today. They all had a little jar, and there were different colors of rice representing different emotions, and she described the emotions and said, all these emotions might be things that you're feeling, and so Fill your jar with what you're feeling, and that was just a really cool thing for them to do tangibly. And then they have this, and it's a picture then. And then if you turn the jar upside down, the rice falls into the lid, and you can't even see it. And it was a great reminder that um, sometimes we can't even see our emotions, but they're there under the surface. And sometimes they get shooken up, and they're all over the place. And, it, and, and that's, God created us to be caring, compassionate creatures. And where do we better see that than in our caring, compassionate Savior, whose tears flowed for the sake of his friend Lazarus, who died. Um, it can tell us a lot. So what might this tell us? All sorts of things. All right, so it appeared Jesus too late. What can this miracle teach us? This is the hard question for me. Um, <laughs> this is the one I'm struggling with this week. Why would someone 51 years old be um, taken from us when he's, you know, an awesome person that most people loved? <laughs> you know, we, we are... I think everybody loved, but most people got along with most of the time. You know, we, we have those, those, those moments with people, and uh, um, yeah, he, well loved by all. Uh, so what can this miracle teach us is that nothing's impossible for God, um, and, but God's timing is God's timing. He is, he's able to uh, uh, do what he needs done, and, and right now, um, and I like that it was kind of woven in here with this uh, our, our brother Jess and whoever it is that you've lost in your life that you know that you're missing, they're in the joys of paradise and there's nothing better for them right now. And I uh, told the kids on Friday and just comically, as is often my go-to when I'm anxious or nervous or upset about things, um, you know, mean old Mr. Thacker, as he liked to get the kids to think he was, but he was nothing but uh, anything but. Um, so mean old Mr. Thacker, he's having the best day out of all of us. And so we're all we're all sad because he's gone, but he's in the, the best place. And so um, there's nothing God cannot do. Nothing can separate us from his love. That's what we lean into, um, not even death. And um, his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. And, and we just take him at his word that he's got a great joy in store for us. And, and all things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. And, and what is the good? It's the ultimate good that uh, those who have died in the faith now receive. And, and may we be there at the right time, and may we, while we're here, um, allowed to bring many along with us to that joy that's waiting to be revealed. So, last question here. That bell just rang out there. That means I gotta get moving. 
Not everyone who heard of this miracle was pleased. The more that people believed in Jesus, the more the Jewish leaders began to work against him. They began to plot Jesus' death. Verse 53 of John 11 says, um, So from that day, they made plans to put him to death. That's, um, that's Lazarus' resurrection. So that was the beginning of Jesus' end here. Uh, they even began to plot his death. What didn't they realize about Jesus? There were many things that he didn't... Um, allowed to be realized or that they just were ignorant and oblivious to. They didn't understand that the one who raised Lazarus from the death could not be defeated by death. <laughs> they could kill Jesus, but they could not stop him. Um, and uh, it was, in fact, part of his plan. The high priest um, in verse 50 here, this is that ironic truth uh, that he said, uh, the high priest says in, in response to hearing this, nor do you understand that it is better for all of you that one man should die for the people not that the whole nation should perish. Um, so Caiaphas speaking those words, speaking, you know, this guy might as well be might as well be dead because um, he's going to bring everybody else down. Um, and in fact, the one man dying for everybody um, is is the reality uh, that that we all needed. And, and and there's something that can be said about the high priest being the guy guy who's chosen by God, even though he's a sinful man who plots to put Jesus to death. He's speaking God's truth, and and it's a truth that the man didn't meet mean. But everybody else um, now, looking back, we're like, it was true. <laughs> That's not what you meant by it, but what you said is true in another way. He didn't realize that, that Jesus' death would do the opposite. Wins forgiveness of sin life for the whole world. His, the one man's death is exactly what the world needed. So um, let's uh, wrap it up here. So we go to the gravesides of our loved ones, our loved ones. We'll one day go to our grave, but when we leave, the body stays in the grave. We might wish for the miracle of Lazarus to be repeated, but we don't see such a thing, do we? What do we hope? What hope do we have in the face of death? We, we have the hope of a heavenly reunion and of the, the new creation. Um, so we, we know that God is the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Whoever lives and believes in him will never die. Um, because even though the earthly death is here, our spirit lives on, and the bodies that we leave behind, God loves and will restore to our souls, our spirits at the end, and we'll stand body and soul again uh, with the body and soul loved ones of all those we, we love and uh, look forward to rejoicing in eternity with. So let us um, pray here. I'm, gonna, I'm short on words at this time, um, but there's good prayers here. So um, let's pray. O God of life, when death takes ones we love, may the promise of our resurrection with them turn our sorrow into joy. And we thank you for the joy you give us in Jesus for this word, uh, which comforts us even in the midst of things that, that are too much for us to bear. Y'all, uh, thank you for enduring with me tonight. And I pray the study of Lazarus's Lazarus's the resurrection was a comfort to you, as it definitely was for me. I uh, apologize for stumbling over my words and slides a little bit here, but um, we'll uh, be back next week, Luke chapter 5, hopefully uh, uh, in person next week. We'll see uh, <laughs> we'll see what the schedule brings. i got to start looking ahead of my calendar to, to not be surprised by these Monday pre-recording times. But uh, the healing of a paralyzed man, coming soon to a Bible study near you, Luke 5, uh, we'll bring to you next week, and we look forward to uh, seeing you. Um, as soon as we can. And rejoice that God sees us all and is watching over us. So let's uh, catch each other later. I'm going to finish the uh, song that we started with. I, I know that my Redeemer lives.
Jesus.